Hill Church as we stand together. Just find two people this morning and welcome them in the presence of the Lord. We also want to welcome you joining us online this morning. Thank you for making time of what the Lord is doing. And if you are here this morning and it is your first time here at Pottersville Church, we want to extend a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for making time and we trust and, and, and believe that we have an amazing time in the presence of the Lord because the Lord God is right here. His word promises us that when two or more are gathered in His name, He is here. So let's just give the Lord a big clap of praise and great welcome and a big shout of praise as we just worship and open our hearts towards Him this morning. As we continue with our worship this morning, may I encourage you, church, that if the Lord gives you a word, please do not hold back, but please do come share with Paulette, Bourbon, and Pastor... Julius, if he is in the room, so we all get to hear what the Lord is saying, because God is always speaking. There's one thing that I always that always encourages me is that it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter your gender, but God is always saying something. So let's just open our spiritual ears to hear and let us not hold back, but come and share. So we all get to hear what the Lord is saying. Hallelujah. Church, in a count of three, I would like us to make some noise before the King of Kings shout a shout of joy before the Lord of Lords because He always encourages us to shout a shout of joy. So I'm going to ask the band to help us with that. So in a count of three, two, one, let's shout a shout of joy to the King of Kings this morning. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords who reigns. So let's worship the Lord together. We want to scream it out from every mountain top because He is good.
brought me and all his love for me all his love for me all the sun's and free all his free
that we called by your name. We thank you, Lord, that we are chosen. We thank you, Lord, that you are our Father. And church, at this moment, I just really feel so much in my heart that there are people here who are battling with forgiveness. But God is saying, I want to set you free from that pain, the pain of unforgiveness, the pain of caring bitterness, the pain of caring resentment. The Lord is here this morning and He just wants to set you free, to enjoy walking under the power of His love, under the power of His forgiveness. The enemy always holds us in that place where he wants us to stay in that place of bitterness because he knows that when we are in that place, there is nothing good that we will have because we are in a place of pain, in a place of bitterness. I really believe the Lord will want us to give that to Him. As we sing this next song, where you are, in your own words, you can just be giving God. You can just give it to Him. Lord, I've carried this for, for so long in my heart and I want to give this to you. I want to enjoy. I want that freedom that comes from giving everything to you because He says He is the one that wants to take and heal. As we give God, there is healing that comes through. So as we continue with worship, I really would like to encourage you to just give it to the Lord. Give Him your pain. Give Him your sadness. Give Him your bitterness. Give Him your anger issues. He wants to set you free. He is the only one who can set you free. Let's pray together and you can just name it. Lord, I'm tired of this anger. Give it to Him. Lord, I'm tired of this bitterness that is stealing my joy because that's what bitterness does. Steals your joy, your freedom that is only found in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we lay down our anger issues to you in the name of Jesus. We lay down our bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment in the name of Jesus. May your blood, the powerful blood of Jesus, wash that away in the name of Jesus. We pray for peace. We pray for love, for hope, for joy in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, Lord, that you are reminding us and promising us that you are able to restore all the years that the locust has eaten, all the years of anger, the years of bitterness, all the years of unforgiveness, Lord. You are restoring that with your love, with your peace, with your joy. In the name of Jesus, we receive wholeness that comes from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, may we give the Lord a big clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing this morning. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Tell your loved ones, your friends, your co-workers about me and tell them of my love for them. Tell the world how I love them. Tell them that I believe in my people in purity of heart and longevity of spirit. Tell them that I am kind, loving, gracious, forgiving. Tell them how much I love them. It is never too late. Never how I love you, my family. As that you are for us. It feels so good to know that you are for us, Lord. No matter what happens, but you are for us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be able to spread the good news of your salvation to our friends, to our families, to our co-workers, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the entire nation, Lord. Let us be able to stand and tell them of who you are. Tell them of the good news and that is you are God and you are full of love. Help us, Lord, to stand firm in knowing who we are in this time, in this time where things are doing, where things are turning for the wrong. But help us, Lord, to, to stand firm and just know that we belong to you and give us the right words to speak, Lord, as we tell people about your goodness, as we tell people about your love, as we tell people of how great you are. Tell people of your miracles because you are a miracle-working God. Help us, Lord, to understand your power as we share those things to people. May they get to know the real God because you are our Father and you God all-powerful. We thank you, Jesus. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God the glory, church. Thank you. Amen and amen. We may take our seats. And as we sit down, can we just allow the Lord to move and touch our hearts just for a few seconds to soak in his love. I believe in this atmosphere, I just sense that the Lord is moving, is touching our hearts. So just for a few seconds, just soak in and allow his love to just flow in your life, flow in your heart, flow in, in you. Yes, Lord, we recognize your presence. And we recognize the move of your presence and the move of your love as you are pouring your love upon each one of us. 
we receive your love this morning Lord touch us touch our lives help us to feel your love Help us to be assured in our hearts that you love us. In Jesus' mighty name. And saints, as we continue to worship the Lord, it's important to just recognize that God loves us. If you can, just look at the person next to you and say, God loves you. And as we worship the Lord, often at times we say we are expressing our love to the Lord. Amen. Jesus at some point um, taught his disciples to love God. He said, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And as we think about that, there's an encouragement that we have in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 8, verse 18 which I believe helps us to recognize and realize how we can love God with all our souls and our minds. And that's from a place of the encouragement that the scripture says. It says in verse 18, Deuteronomy 8 verse 18, and you shall remember the Lord your God. You shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So in this atmosphere, in this moment, can I just encourage each one of us to remember God and to remember what he has done for us, what he is always doing for each one of us in our lives. He is the one who gives us the power to make wealth. He is the one who gives us the opportunity to have income. And as we are continuing in worshiping the Lord, we want to get to a point where we worship God with our substance. And we say, thank you, God. I remember, I acknowledge, and I recognize that my promotion, that my blessing doesn't come from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, but it comes from you. So let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord with our offerings, honoring Him with our tithes. So Lord, we come before you in this moment. As we continue to worship you, to honor you with our substance, we pray, Lord, that you may receive our worship in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Cause my to 
your blessing and your grace. Thank you this morning for your faithfulness in our lives. Thank you for we know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We give you all the glory, Lord, for you are wonderful to us. You are a good, good father. That's why it's easy for us to run to you because you always have the answers to the questions that we have in our lives. Thank you for your blessing and thank you for your grace. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Good morning, Portersville. And good morning to everyone joining us online. If you can, just say hi to the person who is behind you. Maybe you hadn't greeted them as yet. <laughs> I have a few announcements to make this morning, and the first one is to remind all of us that we now have two services for Timothys and youths. Um, so um, it's first service and second service as well. So please encourage your, uh, your children, your little ones, and the youths to be a part of one of those services because they are always having a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord, a great time of worship and a great time of learning as well. So please encourage them to be a part of that. And secondly, um, Mauritius and Surin always run the um, communication and marriage course and in this season it's kicking off on the 18th of March. Please consider to be a part of um, a part of this course. You know marriage is very important to be intentional about. So for everybody who's married and I think for those who are about to get married as well it's important for you to invest in your marriage. So be a part of that program. Uh, contact Serene and um, She'll help you to know how to register and all of that. If you want, even you can go just by the resources desk. You can be able to sign in and um, register yourself there. Now, there's a project that we are about to embark on, something that is exciting. You know, for a while we've been asking for help, saying, can you please come in and help with Children's Church? We need more volunteers and all. And it was because the number of children has been increasing for the past years. But now the number is not settling down, it's continuing to increase. And we've realized that besides just asking for help, for volunteers to come in, we need to consider building a church for our children. So you're all informed that we're getting into that season now where we are doing the preparations for the children's church building. And behind me, you can see the pictures for that building. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. Look at that. Amazing. I know some of you have already seen your child there walking in. <laughs> it's a great investment as a church. We need to invest in our children because they are not just the leaders for tomorrow, but they are the leaders for today. We need to make sure that we um, we're intentional about discipling them and about investing in their lives. Amen. Are you excited about that? All right. Let's give the Lord a clap. Yes, let's give the Lord a clap. Now, um, another reminder as well is that for everyone who comes down Malagwani coming to church, please consider to use the Baha'i off-ramp and to just go past this roundabout opposite the um, uh, church entrance. It's convenient for you. It, it really helps you. I always say it helps you to be in a good place in your spirit so that when you come in, you're not thinking about someone that um, inconvenienced you or that tempted you to say some things you didn't want to say as you were coming to church. Amen. So please consider that. And last but not least, you know that we are always inviting you for discipleship programs. This Wednesday, we have um, a live group session that we, we kicked off last week, and I'm encouraging you to be a part of it. Please come through where we are learning to steward our God-given gifts. So it's part of the series of Becoming, but we are emphasizing how you can steward your God-given gifts. And on Saturday, the 16th of March, we have our Be That Man meeting, right? So all men, you are invited. Please come through and be a part of a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord as we are learning and growing to become the man that God has called us. Amen. Can you help me to give Pastor Kurt a warm welcome as he comes up to share the word?
So Lord, we thank you for Pastor Kat, and we thank you for the word that you have deposited in him this morning. We thank you for what you want to release to us, oh God, and we pray that we be able to receive your word in Jesus' mighty name. Bless him and speak through him in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Very good morning, family. Just want to share with you that Pastor Kevin, Pastor Helen have arrived safely. They're in the U.S. They're doing that grandparent thing, and they, are, they look like they are thoroughly enjoying it. Uh, let's continue to keep them in our prayers, and let's also just allow ourselves to just grow. We're in this incredible series of becoming, and becoming is a process. And what, what we're trying to achieve as we go through this is for us to go from one level of spiritual maturity to the next. So last week, Pastor Kevin was talking about facing your giants. And if you didn't get an opportunity to hear that sermon, it is available. Please do listen to that because it really is crucial. It's a crucial step of becoming whatever God wants you to be is to just deal with the obstacles that are in front of you, and get ready to move on. Today, I'm thinking about something that concerns all of us. And I know that as we go through life, we all experience many, many challenges. And sometimes as we look through the storms that we've come through, We'll look back and we don't even know how we made it through. All that we're aware of is that the person who walked into that storm so very different from the person who comes out of it. And when you do go through a storm in your life, just understand this. God wants you to have Jesus in your boat when you face that storm. Because when Jesus is in the boat, you know everything is going to be okay and you're going to survive it. So today, today's sermon is entitled, Becoming Comforted. And as I think about that, I'm thinking of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and how he really comes to give us hope. He wants us to know that He has the ability to make things better in the long run than what they are now. So He started off His ministry where He says, Repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And and that word repent that He uses, yes, it has the idea of turning around and going in a different direction. But that Greek word metanoia also had the idea of a change of mindset. A change in the way that you think, the way that you view and perceive things. And God is wanting us to have that change in mindset as we go through that. And as we think about that, as we think about the storms that we go through, and we think about the need to have Jesus in your boat. You know, the the disciples faced two storms. And the one where it seemed like Jesus was asleep, and the other where Jesus wasn't in the boat. And if I think back to the time when they were they're out in the sea, it was the night, the evening, Jesus had gone up the mountain to pray, the disciples had got out into the boat and they were going on to the other side. They left in the evening. If you're reading the text, John chapter 6 says they had traveled about three, maybe three and a half miles. But it was the fourth, the fourth watch when Jesus started walking towards them. And and for those of us who don't understand ancient Roman times, so the first watch began at 6 o'clock in the evening. Second watch is 9 o'clock. The third watch is 12 o'clock, midnight. The fourth watch is 3 a.m. These people have been traveling, straining at the oars, for nine hours, and all that they're able to achieve is three miles. You need to have Jesus in your boat when you're going through a storm so that you can at least make headway. Jesus, in his sermon, as he speaks, 
In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Can I ask you to say to your neighbor, they will be comforted. You know, often we, we associate mourning with sadness and death. But there's more to mourning than that. There's so many reasons for which we go into that place of mourning and sorrow. Sometimes it's when relationships break down. Sometimes when we feel as if we're losing our security, perhaps a job or income or something like that. When we experience financial losses, or sometimes when we struggle with personal well-being. You know, as I think of the COVID season that we've come through and some of the difficulties and the hardships that we have experienced, that the people around us have experienced, sometimes we need to know that God has the ability to comfort and console us over the losses that we've sustained and that we should not lose hope because He has come so that we will have hope. Sometimes our sadness is about our relationship with God. Sometimes we're in that place where we feel like, I, I wish I can just stop sinning the way that I do. I wish I could have this closeness with God. I wish that I could have an inner strength that when I face the temptations that come my way, that I can just respond in a way that Jesus teaches in His Word. I wish that when I speak, I wouldn't say things that are hurting the people around me. I wish I had the ability to build people up, to strengthen them, to give them courage, to help them to make it through the difficulties that they're experiencing. Sometimes we feel like I'm so, so far away from God. Sometimes we feel like God doesn't have the ability to forgive us for what we've done. Or perhaps we feel like He doesn't have the desire to do that. And nothing could be further from the truth. His death on the cross shows that He has the desire for us to be forgiven. And His resurrection from the dead shows that He has the power over death and that He has already paid the price for the sin that we've committed in our lives. And so God wants us to live with hope. I think it's one of the keys of the Sermon on the Mount is to live with hope. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, there's going to be a storm. And here's what Jesus is saying about that storm. The storm is going to come. But the wise man built his house on a rock. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And when the storm came against that heart, it was able to stand because it's on solid foundation. And I believe that's what God wants for us. God wants us to have a solid, rock-solid philosophy of life, an understanding of the experiences that we go through and the ability to respond to those in a way that will give Him glory. The storms in our lives will cause sorrow and loss. And when we experience that sorrow and loss, we're going to grieve. Yes, we grieve. And the truth is that a big part of our grieving is that we are in a spiritual battle where we are at war with an enemy who is trying to kill us. We are fighting for our lives in this war. And war never is easy. War does come with pain and heartache and loss. But for us, at least we know that Jesus has taken care of this, that the battle has already been won. It's for us to come through this. If we think about the way that we live lives, some of the decisions that we make, the things that we do, the sin that's in our lives, let's recognize sin hurts us and it hurts the people around us. And the sins of the people around us has the potential to hurt us as well. And so there's going to be pain and there's going to be grief as we go through life, as we learn how to live in a way that God has taught us to live. But that's okay because there's hope. 
Because as we go through these experiences and we recognize these things, we make changes. And nobody is exempt from the pain and the difficulties and the hardships that we experience as we go through life. Even in the case of the Apostle Paul, when he was writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, he says, Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine and yet regarded as impostors, known and yet regarded as unknown. Dying, and yet we live on. We're beaten, but we're not killed. We're sorrowful, but we're always rejoicing. We're poor, but we're making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. As we look at the Apostle Paul, speaking about his situation, his life, his ministry, we are recognizing that as we go through life, we are going to experience these hardships. But here's what we're rejoicing about. In the pressing and in the crashing, God is making new wine. Can I ask you to say to your neighbor, new wine? I try to imagine what the Apostle Paul would have felt like at the beginning of this transition where he's moving from Judaism and into Christianity. And he's in Damascus. You know, all his life, he wanted to just be devoted to God, to live for everything that God wants. That's why he became a Pharisee. He wanted to be one of those set aside specifically for God's purpose. That's what he wanted to achieve. But his theology was faulty. And he didn't recognize Jesus when Jesus came. And I can't imagine what it would have been like for him as he was sitting there and he's thinking about those words, a question from Jesus where Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he walks away from that experience and he's really, really struggling with it. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 9, it says, For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. He's in this place of remorse, sorrow, and he cannot understand how did he miss. All of this, this, this learning, the scriptures that he could probably quote, how did he miss Jesus in all of that? And how could he have treated the people, the Christian people, disciples of Jesus, the way that he did and believe that he was doing the work of God in all of that? And he really is struggling. And sometimes, I take it further, sometimes I look into my own life and I say, what are the things that cause me sorrow? Where are my areas of mourning? Is it when I lose my personal comfort? Or is it perhaps when I look at the struggles of the people who are around me and as I think they go through the hard times? And sometimes there's this despair when I examine my own actions, the things that I do and say, and the things that I don't do when I'm supposed to do them. And last week's sermon, you know, we were looking at how detrimental pride is to our spiritual walk. And I've got to ask myself, how strong is that pride factor in my life? And, and how does that draw me away from what God wants? How many times do I say, no, but what I want is so much more important 
than what God wants me to do. You know, we live in a world where people are even proud of the sins that they commit. I remember when I was a teenager, I was 14 years old, I was living in a newly built suburb in Johannesburg, visiting one of my friends, and, and this person's father had a strange boast. He'd tell his friends, see this house, and I mean it was a nice house. He says, I didn't pay for anything in this house. I stole everything from the bricks <laughs> to the roof tiles, even the cement and river sand. And you're like, what kind of a boast is that? Why is it that people can boast about how drunk they were? Man, I was just so senseless, totally wasted. Couldn't stand up, vomit all over the place. It was horrible. Yeah, that's what makes me a great person. And you're trying to understand, why do we do that? Sometimes people boast about who they thumped or how hard they thumped that person, how much damage they were able to exert on the other person's body, or how many sexual encounters they were had as they were going through life. And sometimes we're proud about things that we really shouldn't be proud about as we go through life. And, and the problem with that is that pride doesn't work in favor of God's purpose in our lives. It's very difficult to repent of the things that we're proud of. When we walk in pride, there is no mourning, there is no forgiveness, there is no comfort, there is no hope. And so we've got to get to the place of humility, and we've got to allow Grief to have whatever work it has in our lives. And if it is over sin, then let's just allow that. Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians. This is 2 Corinthians. Now, the first letter, there was something that he said to them that was astounding. There was something going on in the church in Corinth that was amazing. And he says, you know what? The pagans don't even do what is going on there in the church. He said... He addresses the church to the saints in Corinth. You know, the, the, these holy people who have been sanctified by God. And then he says, pagans don't even do what's going on in your congregation and you are proud of it. He says, shouldn't you rather be ashamed? And then when he writes 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm going to read at verse 8, he says, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see now that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so you were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So, when our sins grieve us, we should see that as an opportunity to grow. And it doesn't matter the grief, really. Whatever kind of grief we're experiencing, even if it's the grief of loss, Let's see this as an opportunity for us to grow. We grow. Can I, can I ask you to say to your neighbor, we grow. We, grow. we can't stay there. God, I don't believe God wants us to stay in this place of remorse and sadness and sorrow and depression. God wants us to grow. Something has to change, and, and, and it's so good when the change is taking place in the way that we think and the way that we view the situations around us. When we're trying to see our situation from a godly perspective and we're trying to see the good that could possibly come out of the difficulties that we're facing. And so we look forward to the changes that will come about in our lives as a result of that growth. Whatever your burden is, here's what Jesus would say to you. He would say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, 
and I'll give you a rest. Take your yoke, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls because my burden is, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm thinking of the word that, that Polly shared with us today where God is giving us that assurance that He wants us to have that kind of rest, the peace that comes from laying down our burdens. His yoke is easy, His burdens is light. He, he, he wants us to have hope, to, to, to throw off some of the things that we're carrying, but there's no point in throwing that off if we're not going to take up the yoke that Jesus would have us carry. And often it's, it's difficult for us to realize that the, some of the things that we are carrying around in our lives are not good for us. I'm reminded, though, of a story that Jesus once told about a young man who came to his father and said, please give me my share of the estate. And then he went off to a distant land and he started to live for pleasure. And the problem with living for pleasure is that it's expensive. So it wasn't long before all of his money ran out. And then he had this sorrow, this, this, this need in his life. And that need is what made him think about what he should do next, reevaluate the way that he's living, and what is important, what are the real values in life. And it was when he was at this point of extreme hunger where he was able to swallow his pride and get back up and go back to his father and just experience the open arms of a father who wants him to just come back, come back home and have that family environment, have the care and protection that a truly loving, godly, good, heavenly father wants for us to have. Sometimes the question is, what needs to happen in order for us to be in that place where we're just feeling that the arms of God are around us and we're really living out the life that God has called us to. When the Apostle Paul was on a missionary trip, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he, 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 he's on this missionary trip and, and he got this insight that he explains in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed about the hardships that we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and He will deliver us. On Him, we have set our hope that He will continue to deliver us. The Apostle Paul was in this place where he didn't know if he even wanted to face the next day, but he held on to the hope that he has in God. So when we're under trial, we need to remember how important it is to rely on God. Pride will call you to resolve your, 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 your problem your own way, in your own strength, and that you walk away feeling like you did something good. But really, God is wanting us to just hand our burdens over to Him. James, in James chapter 1, in verses 2 and 3, he says, Consider it pure joy when you experience the testing of your face because you know that you're going to, in, in all of this trial, you're going to have a character benefit that's going to come out of this because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and not lacking in anything. And when we're looking to the Apostle Paul's life, we just see trial after trial and tribulation after tribulation. And somehow, he was able to grow in his faith to where he could see the value of what he was experiencing. 
And in Romans chapter 5, this is what he says about it. In Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, he says, Not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. So as we go through whatever it is that we're going through, let's look for the ways in which we can grow in character through the experiences that we're having. Let's also grow in endurance. Let's not give up. Let's just keep going. If we can't face the next week, then let's face the next day. And if we can't face the next day, then let's face the next hour. And if we can't face the next hour, then let's just face the next minute. But let's just go through this one step at a time, holding on and ex- watching the changes and the, and, and, and the differences that come and knowing that there's going to, we're going to be able to look back on this and see purpose and see growth and development and be stronger for it. We had a GLS here not so long ago, and one of the lessons that was really amazing for me came from a man by the name of Chris Matobella. Today, his pastor Chris. But before he was born, his parents were really concerned that having their six children was difficult and having a seventh was going to be even more difficult. And so they tried to figure out how could they prevent this child from being born because they felt like they couldn't afford it. But he exists. He's a real person. And he had his real hardships in life. He made it through that, and when he was 10 years old, he was living on the streets in Johannesburg, and in that situation, I can assure you that he would have seen things that a 10-year-old is not supposed to see. He would have had experiences that a 10-year-old should never experience, and he describes his, his life looking for sustenance, looking for food, going from dustbin to dustbin. You, you just feel for him. And you know that he's experiencing a lot of pain and hardship and suffering. And then his situation changed. When he was 15, year old, 15 years old, somebody took him in, took him into her family and gave him another chance, a chance at education. And you know, some, some children, when they go to school, they go in kicking and screaming and they don't want to be there and they oppose the learning and they'd rather be doing other things. But for Chris, for Chris, when he was 15 years old and learning to read for the first time, for him that was a privilege. And I mean, he learned to read and he just read and read and read. And I don't want to make a meal of it, but, but, but his life changed. Today he is an incredible leader. He leads a church He is a pastor. He spoke at the Global Leadership Summit. That's an honor that is not bestowed on many, many people. But he's grown and he's developed. And he has an organization where he takes care of street children in Johannesburg. He knows what life is like out there. And his mission and purpose is to go back there and to make a difference. And he sees how that can break down your humanity, and so he tries to get people to understand what citizenship, what real, true, godly citizenship looks like. And he teaches that to those children who desperately need to learn these kinds of lessons so that our world could be a better place. If, if, if nobody teaches those children how to live right, The rest of us will be living in fear for our own lives. And so sometimes the hardship has a positive effect. And so I I say after we've come through the growth, the next thing we need to do is to go. We go. We lay down our, our burdens in order that we can take up the yoke of Jesus. Sometimes I wonder what the Apostle Paul's life would have been like if he had decided, you know, He has this grace of God. He's got the forgiveness. His eyesight has been restored. Imagine if he'd gone back to Tarsus and he decided, you know, I've learned the skill of making tents, so I'll just be a tent maker for the rest of my life. No imprisonments, no severe floggings, no repeated exposure to death time and again, no 39 lashes from the Jews, the angry Jews, no shipwrecks, 
No lying on a board in the open sea day and night. No danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from false brothers. No sleepless nights, no hunger, no thirst. None of that. No concern for all of the churches. No burning inside himself when a Christian person is drawn into sin and decides to leave the faith and live there. Just no worries. I wonder what it would have been like if the Apostle Paul had gone that road. But I don't have to wonder about that. It makes no sense to wonder about that because that's not what he chose to do. When we read Acts chapter 9 and verse 20, it says, At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished. And they asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among, among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? And yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. So perhaps it, it would help us to see evangelism as a rescue mission. You know, some of God's children have been taken captive by the devil to do the devil's work. And God desperately wants his children to come back. The devil doesn't treat God's children very well. There was a time in the life of David where he'd gone out with his army and his family was in a place called Ziklag. And when they came back to Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had raided their village. Everything was burned and their family members were gone. Oh man, it was a terrible situation. Because he's in that place of grieving sorrow. In fact, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 30, in verse 4, it says, So David and his men wept aloud, until they had no strength left to weep. And, and sometimes, you know, when grief comes in, there's anger and bitterness that comes in with that. David's soldiers were so distressed and so angry and so bitter that they were talking about stoning him. And David found strength in the Lord. And in verses 7 and 8, it says, Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. And Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. Sometimes the, the goal that comes from the, the, the grief is, is to get back some of what we've lost. Let's change the situation. And let's, when we've lost joy, we've got to go and get that back. But sometimes there's more than joy than we lose in the difficulties that we're experiencing. And I don't know who this verse is for, but I've been looking at the book of Nehemiah lately. And in chapter 4, verse 14, as they're building up the walls around Jerusalem. He says, After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, to the officials, and to the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And again, I want you to just think back to the word that Polly shared with us today. God wants us to have that concern and that love for the people around us and fighting for your brothers and your children and your wives and your homes isn't about getting violent and angry and going out and inflicting harm. It's about getting on our knees and talking to God it's about just allowing the love of God to come into our hearts and our lives and for us to touch people in a different way. Fighting for our wives and our families sometimes is about just treating them with love and patience and kindness and gentleness and protecting them from a world 
out there, from a philosophy out there that would draw them away from God. Sometimes that's what the fighting involved. But this is what God is calling us to do. Jesus says, blessed are those who are mourning because you're going to be comforted. The storms are going to come. And when the storms come, we're pressed high. We are pressed hard on every side, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but we're not destroyed. We're always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus can also be made manifest in our mortal bodies. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that His life can be revealed in our mortal bodies. So when Jesus is not in your boat, then you need to get out of your boat, walk on the water to where He is, and just have that faith and have Him pull you up, keep your head above the waves, and know that in all of this, we're going to glow. Say, we glow. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 15. He says, and this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people will cause thanksgiving to overflow for the glory of God. And therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. God wants us to look. Let's look beyond the here and now. Man, I love that woman who, who when she was going through hard times, she said she had the King James, the old King James version of the Bible, and she said, when I'm going through difficulties... I just think about my favorite verse in the Bible, and it's the one that says, it came to pass. Because if the Bible said it would came to stay, that would be a problem, but it came to pass. <laughs> when we focus on what's causing our sadness, we can get stuck in mourning. And so we've got to think about the growth. We've got to think about the things that we need to do and the glory that comes from a godly response to the trials that we're facing in our lives. And sometimes it, it, it bothers me that this text says, our light and momentary afflictions. What's he talking about light and momentary? Okay. But let's just remember, it's, it's, it's the Apostle Paul that we're talking about. I would love to see what he looked like when he was writing Second Timothy. I know when he was writing Galatians chapter 6, he says, let nobody cause me trouble because I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Amen. So try to think about what it would be like if you had gone through what he's gone through, the beatings, the imprisonments, the being stoned to death, all of that. When, when he says light momentary and, and, and we're sitting in judgment on him, let's just think twice about that, okay? Let's understand that he, his thinking with eternity in mind and when you have an eternal perspective, then what we're going through is light and momentary. And we'll see that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49, where he's just talking about the resurrection of the dead and what kind of body the dead is going to come with, here's what he says. He says, And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Here's how John says it in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. First of all, he says, Oh, behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we could be called the children of God. And then he says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when He appears, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. And then he goes on, in, 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 you know, James goes on, James, who was saying, consider it pure joy and you meet various trials. In verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has prepared for those who love him. And going back to Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, about these light momentary afflictions, he says, For I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. 
So we need to be motivated to keep on going. And as he's writing that last letter, Paul is writing to Timothy. He's passing on the baton. And he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Let me explain endure. Don't go around it and don't run away from it. Go through it because it can do something for you. He says, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all who have loved His appearing. So we live in a fallen world. We are fallen people. There are fallen people around us, and we're going to go through hardships. We grieve. And there's a lot of different reasons for our grief, whether it be loss or maybe there were experiences that we hoped that we were going to have and we don't have those experiences anymore. Maybe there's personal relationships that are failing or our relationship with God isn't quite what it needs to be. But we're going to grow. We grow when we change our mind. We change our behaviors. We change our routines. And we look for ways in which this current situation can become better than what it is. And we develop a desire to help others also. And then we go. We determine not to stay stuck in grief. We go to God. We go back to the battlefield. We find a godly mission and we fight to get back what we've lost. And we experience the blessing of God that comes with that and we glow. We, we boast about our scars. I mean, you can read some of the war stories where these guys are saying, oh man, then I got shot in the leg. And, some, in the leg. and somebody else says, oh, sh- shot in the leg. That's nothing. I took a bullet through the head. Uh, and, 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 and here we are. We're, we, we, we're seeing the greatness in the suffering that we experienced on the battlefield. And we recognize that it was worth it because of the cause for which we were. Hopefully it was a good cause that they were on the battlefield. But that's what happens. We find that godly mission and, and we find new strengths. We realize that we can do now things that we weren't able to do before. And we celebrate the reward that God has prepared for those who love Him. There's a direction, there's a purpose, we're going to a place. And, and while the Worship team gets ready to come back. There were three people from three different nations were having this conversation, and one of them said, you know, we're a great nation. We were the first to put a man into space. And the other one says, we're a great nation. We were the first to land a man on the moon. And the other one said, and we're a great nation. We were the first to put a man on the sun. And they looked at him really strangely, and he wasn't backing down. So they said, it's not possible. You can't even get close enough to the sun to land on it. You'll be miles and miles away before you're burnt to a crisp. And he says, yeah, we knew that, so we went at night. <laughs> now, why, why did I tell you that? I tell you that because some people think that the sun is switched off at night. They go through a rainy or a cloudy day and they say, oh, the sun is gone. And it hasn't. The sun is always there, day and night. Even in the darkest hour, the sun is shining. And when you think about that, I want you to know And no matter what you're going through, God is there. And if He's not in your boat, 
then get out of the boat, walk across the water, and go to where He is. And if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, then now's the time. And if there's things that you're struggling with, if, if there's grief in your life and you need to move on and you're finding it difficult, we've, we've got a prayer team that, that, that would just love to pray with you as you come forward. Just lay your burden down. Come to Jesus. If, if you're weary and burdened, allow Him to give you rest and peace. We're, we're going to sing this song. And I encourage you, come forward and allow the change that's necessary in your life to get you to the next level. God bless you.
Father, we recognize that you are an awesome, glorious God. And Father, we recognize that sometimes we go through hard times and we don't know how to respond. And I pray that you will just reveal for each one of us who is struggling with mourning, I pray that you will reveal the next step that we need to take in order for us to move into the place where we receive comfort that comes from you. We thank you that you have given us the absolute assurance that this is what you have planned and purposed for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And I ask you to just turn to the person who's next to you and to speak a blessing over that person. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you forever. Be comforted. God bless.